Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the Losing My Religion channel. Today, we're going to talk about trauma responses after the cult. And if you're new to my channel, I am an ex-cult member, a cult survivor of the International Church of Christ cult. I was a member for almost 12 years. I left in 2006. And so I'm going to share a little bit about my personal experience in the second half of this video per a request from one of my subscribers who had asked asked me about that, you know, and how it affects me personally, where I'm at with it now. But to begin Let's talk about, you know, the trauma responses, meaning, you know, how it affects you after, after you leave a cult, whatever kind of cult or abusive church or group that you are part of. So there are some particular categories that people who study this stuff, who work with cult survivors, uh, have surmised. And it really is not just cult survivors. This is really trauma from any kind of abusive, traumatic situation. And so the first thing to recognize is if you were in a cult, if you've engaged in any kind of cult, then you are, you know, affected by that situation. And of course, it's in varying degrees. We're all different. None of us are robots. We are all unique in how things impact, impact us and how we interpret things from our experiences. But with that said, there are a lot of commonalities and one of the things I found with myself and with so many people who I come across doing this work is that when you survive a cult, particularly, there is this stigma attached to it. It's such a quote unquote weird kind of thing that you feel very embarrassed and ashamed and, and so is a lot of, of self-doubt and in downplaying that happens because it's just hard to accept. It's hard to accept you've been in a cult and, and it's hard to accept how this affected you or that you're affected at all. And that's for different reasons, but, you know, no one wants to no one wants to accept that. It's a hard pill to swallow. And when we go through trauma, the first thing to understand is if you were part of a cult, most likely you were traumatized on some level. And, and give yourself that, that validation because one thing with cult trauma specifically versus certain other traumas is that cult traumas are not validated. You know, you come out of a cult church like the ICOC or Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that, and people often just say, well, you should just go to another church or don't give up on God. But no one acknowledges or or validates the fact that you were traumatized. And so a lot of times we as cult survivors traumatize ourselves. And so these type of categories are not really to put anyone in a box. I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it from a perspective of some things to consider that may or may not apply to you. And so it, we have fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And um, I'm recently learning about some of these concepts as well. So 
you know, a lot of this is learning, self-education, you know, as, as you go through this process. And so fight and flight makes sense because that's how we're wired, you know, when we're in a dangerous situation and, you know, freezing and fawn, fawn is an acronym. Uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but, you know, these are also real things. And as I look through this list, these categories, I can relate to a lot of these, you know, um, the fight is like, you know, it says irritability, anger, aggression, moving toward. Um, flight says, you know, anxiety and fear, panic, avoiding chronic worry and perfectionism. Freeze says stuckness, collapse, immobilization, spacing out, disassociation, depression, chain. And fawn, it says people pleasing, avoiding conflict, prioritizing others' needs over your own. Difficulty saying no, setting difficulty setting boundaries. And for me, the ones that, that I relate to and have experienced are in the flight, freeze, and fawn categories. Um, and so those, those are ones that I can speak to personally. Um, but fight, you know, feeling angry and aggression and having certain things, that's something that some people do wrestle with. And, um, you know, when you've been abused and you've essentially have gone through a lot of, you know, trauma, we can feel like it's like you wake up out of that, you get out of that. And there is this sense of, of self-preservation where you just feel like it's you against the world. Um, but having anxieties and fears, you know, um, panic attacks. I, I had those when I left, I've had, I had panic attacks, um, especially the first few years. And I, you know, I went through, yeah, chronic worry, perfectionism. I mean, each of these could be its own video really. But yeah, being anxious, it's not uncommon, you know, to, to possibly need medication or something to calm your nervous system because it is, when you've been traumatized, there is damage, you know, to your, your nervous system. It is physiological as well as psychological, emotional, and spiritual. And so... I was paranoid when I first left. I was terrified of running into people from the cult. And the thing about it was, it's not that they were going to physically harm me or they were going to physically corner me and throw me in a car and drive me back to the church. I mean, that wasn't how you know the ICOC operated at least in my experience, I've heard certain things that were very troubling, but, but for me, I was, that wasn't it. It was not the physical danger. It was just so deeply psychological and, and probably spiritual, you know, that this fear, this anxiety of seeing them, um, that, I mean, when I would go out, Cause I lived, you know, in a, in a small city and it's very easy to run into ICOC people. You know, when you've been there for so long, you know, the hangout spots, you know, where they are a lot of times. And they're pretty easy to track because when you're in the, in, you know, the group, 
usually, well, the ICOC group, at least, you know, there was certain things, you know, areas where they would be like people kind of lived in a bubble, even though they went to work and went, you know, to the store and different things, they still were kind of in this bubble where they were limited. So it's not like you would see them everywhere, but I was in panic over seeing running into someone from the church. Uh, I literally would have panic attacks and, you know, would have to calm myself down because I couldn't breathe. Um, I, I had situations like once I saw a, a girl that had got me kicked out of the household I was living in who lied on me. Um, and she was the one the girl I recruited, which is funny, but I remember seeing her in the supermarket one time and and I hid. Like I would duck and hide from people. You know, I just I just couldn't I couldn't face them, but I would be sick for the rest of the day. It would really it just was traumatizing even seeing them again. And um and the thing is, a lot of times you run into people from the cult. They're 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 brainwashed. They're under mind control, but they're very they're very cold. They're very they're very uh, they lack self awareness. They lack caring and and love, and you know they're unsafe people. And so, a lot of times they say things or do things that are inappropriate. They don't respect boundaries. Cults don't have boundaries. So seeing people from the cult, they they have no qualms about things they would say or ask, or there's no sense of, you know, I don't want to pry or, you know, or, or they don't have any concern about what they say and how it makes you feel. So I went through these things, you know, even the perfectionism, that's something that's ongoing. It's like feeling like you have to be feeling like in your process of healing that you have to be healed by a certain time, feeling like what you're doing isn't good enough, you know, or your degree of healing isn't happening fast enough. And you just constantly just being hard on yourself. Like I, I, I still, I still wrestle with that. I'm a lot, I'm a lot better now and I have help and in, in support, you know, through my own mental health support system that, you know, like with my therapist and stuff that helps me work through that. But I, I am, I am a lot better. So it's not really, it's not really as much of an issue as it used to be, but it's always, it can always rear its ugly head in, in some shape or form. So I have to be aware of that. It's just that feeling of, you know, how you talk to yourself and feeling like you should, I should be this. I shouldn't be feeling that. That kind of thing is all perfectionism. And, you know, feeling stuck, stuckness. And, you know, um, you know, immobilization, disassociation, depression, and shame. And, you know, I can attest to all of those things. And those things come with surviving a cult experience. It really does. None of that is abnormal. None of that makes you weird or crazy or, or inadequate or weak. That's what happens when you come from cult trauma, you know, and and people pleasing and avoiding avoiding conflict, prioritizing other people over your own needs, you know, having a hard time saying no boundaries, you know, having really poor boundaries. All of these things are to be expected coming out of a cult situation and looking at the bigger picture, it might be whatever happened before the cult situation. So, you know, your childhood, whatever, you know, the framework that you were brought up, you know, in, it also ties directly to this. So 
if you didn't have boundaries before the cult, you probably, you know, didn't have them, you know, you're not going to have them now, you know, like the cult is going to exploit those things. And, and, you know, these types of things like setting boundaries, I'm reading a really good book on boundaries now. And um, I think it's called Boundary Boss. If you, if you look that up, I might link it in the description. If you, if you want to just look at it, but it's, it's a really good book and it's written by a therapist and someone also who has gone through learning boundaries. And it is important, you know, because cults destroy your boundaries. You, you don't have boundaries. So you have to learn those things, you know, people pleasing, you know, in the ICOC cult, it was very ironic because they always used to, used to scold people for people pleasing because they would say, you know, it's a sin in the Bible, but there's no way to to function within the group without people pleasing. So it was it was a, a contradiction. Um, but you you find yourself, you know, it, it's like it, it people pleasing goes along with weak boundaries in that you 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 know you have to in a cult you have to say yes to everything to be accepted to be considered a good christian or a good you know uh member you know so that you know was considered being spiritual um and the stuckness you know when i was talking about the freeze you know the being stuck i mean that's a real thing you know you go through different cycles and phases throughout your post-cult experience, you know, of, of this healing process. And feeling stuck is normal, you know, when you're traumatized. Cause you know, I went through I went through a, a long period where I felt stagnant, like stuck, and I couldn't get unstuck. And and I was just like then the perfectionism kicks in because you're you're like, why am I stuck? What's wrong with me? I should be unstuck. I should be doing this right now. And, and some of this comes from, you know, the cult. A lot of us put our lives on hold being in the cult. It's like we we missed out on, on opportunities to advance in our careers or education or just general life experiences and relationships. And, and so because of that, it feels like the time spent in the cult was like a time warp and you step out of it and you don't have anything to show for it. You've lost all this time. And so now you're kind of rebuilding your life again you're, or you're getting your life back on track and finding yourself and, and all that stuff. So, you know, you can feel stuck. You can feel stuck. You can feel like dead inside. You can feel like I don't have any emotions. And some of that, I think, really can be attributed to not being allowed to have emotions. It's like our humanity was taken when being in a cult. It, it's, it robs your humanity. It demonizes your humanity. So your ability to have emotions and feelings and your desires. So you really you really do experience that. And I think it comes through in stuckness because you, you haven't gotten in touch with yourself yet. You know, you have, you, 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 you have to come alive inside and, and to begin to embrace yourself and your feelings and, and to even engage your own feelings. Cause you just learn that you have to suppress your emotions. Only certain emotions are okay. And so you know, it would dysregulate it emotionally. And we have to learn how to identify our emotions and then put language to them. And then to find like a healthy regulation of those emotions, how to express them. And, and I think that sometimes comes through with the fight where there's aggression and, you know, irritability or, you know, uh, extreme highs and lows. So here's some other things that 
a trauma responses can look like. Um, you know, feeling gosh, I can't read this, y'all. <laughs> it's so small. Hold on a second. So, all right. So, craving and con craving control, agreeing to things just to keep the peace, feeling on guard all the time, a negative worldview, dwindling trust for other people, seeking constant escapism, feeling responsible for others' happiness, saying yes because you're scared of losing security chronic feelings of emptiness, giving in to reckless impulses, not caring for your personal safety. And um, I said a lot just now, but those are some things that trauma responses can look like. And I agree with this. I think, you know, it definitely can look like these things. I'm not saying these are the only things it can look like, but definitely I've experienced some of these um, you know, feeling on guard a lot, you know, um, craving control. Sometimes it's like we go from one extreme to the other. And and I, I found myself having to learn to have healthy boundaries because then, you know, you're it, it, I'm still I'm still learning that, but I'm much better than I was. But at first it's like, you know, I came out, I had no boundaries and got to some sticky situations. And then I had these, you know, walls up that were so rigid, it's like no one can get in. And then, you know, now I'm trying to find like a middle ground to that. And, you know, it's been much better, but it's definitely work in progress and it takes time. Um, feeling responsible for other people's happiness when you come out of a cult, you know, a lot of times it's like, yeah, you have to like work that caring, caring about yourself, how you feel, what affects you, what's in your best interest. All of that doesn't matter. In fact, that's seen as being selfish and ungodly and all these other things. So it's all about the collective and not the individual. So a lot of these things come out of that experience. But uh, I wanted to. I want to end here. It's getting a little long this video, um, and I want to just share a little bit about you know what what one of my subscribers asked me about how I'm doing with things, and one of the things they brought up was what I mentioned. Um, I mentioned in a past video about how I struggle with with giving, you know, with the whole tithing thing after leaving and, you know, just financial giving to things. And, you know, after being in the ICOC cult, it was it was a lot. There was trauma surrounding that and just being coerced and guilted into into giving money I didn't have and how, you know, put me in such a bad situation. Well, I was already in a in a, a difficult financial situation, but how it made it even more, even worse. And so um, I think, you know, like where am I at with that now? Um, check out my other videos on this too. I, I did two videos explaining this you know, a few years ago, one of them is says three things I can never do again after leaving the ICOC. And I did another video on, you know, uh, things that, how, how do I say this? How, how uh, being in a cult affects you. So I, I think the video is called six ways being in a cult affects your life. So definitely check those out. I'll link them at the end of the video and in the description.
or in the comment section. But, um, you know, the person asked how it affected me. And I, I talked about it in previous videos. But the update on that, I would say, is... I'm, you know, I, I don't, some things that, you know, I've had to accept that I just will never be again. I'm one of those things, as I said in the previous video, I, I'm not going to be a part of the church again. That's just never going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, another thing, I'm just not going to be, I'm not going to be that, that yes person that, you know, is going to give you the shirt off her back. It's just not, it's not going to happen. You know, um, I'm, and, and one of the things that I've just come to, I'm coming to, you know, just accept certain things and, and not worrying about what other people think about it or judging. It's like showing up as myself like my version, what my version of being generous means may not be your version. And my version of it is not giving someone a shirt off my back. And then I need to go ask someone for a shirt because I'm freezing to death. It's just silly, you know. And of course, we can, we can say the, the, the accept this exceptions to that, right? If you have a child or whatever, you know, but for the most part, it's like, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's like if, to me. So the whole financial piece, I, I'm i just never going to be that person again. You know, I'm not going to be that person who is... And I, I don't think I ever really was, but, you know, I was really under so much pressure in the church, in the cult to to give financially. But I still feel, I still feel a certain way about that. Like, like, you know, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just, I, but I'm, I'm just, I mean, definitely not with the church. But my thing now is I'm just not going to let anyone guilt me into giving money. Like even when, even when I'm driving and, you know, you're at the corner, there's a thing now where people are standing around holding these cardboard signs, asking for money at intersections. If you live in a, in a city, you've seen them. And, you know, I used to feel so guilty, like, I'm not giving them money or whatever. And and now, you know, I'm like, I don't. I really, I really don't. I'll have a fleeting thought here and there sometimes of, of you know, maybe I should do this. But 99% of the time, I don't. You know, it's like, I don't like being coerced or guilted, you know, into giving someone money whether that's, that's definitely won't be a church because I don't go to church. But even in, in every way you turn, people are asking for money. And so whether it's the person on the corner or, you know, um, I volunteer in a nonprofit sector. So, you know, that's something that I've had to deal with, like my feelings around that. And it, you know, I can, I can, I I've can handle it when it's going to a cause that I know and feel good about. And, and the organization I'm with does good work and I know the person personally that runs it. And so that's okay for me. But I, I that's what I would say to end it is that as long where I'm at now is, is I need to know if I give financially what it's going to, how it's being used. And if I don't get a clear answer on that, then I don't give and I don't beat myself up about it. 
You know, if I choose not to, it's a choice. It doesn't make me good or bad. Just like when you check out at a store and the cashier asks if you want to donate an extra dollar to the children's hospital or something. You know, I'm, I might say okay or I might not. I mean, you know, if my finances are tight, then, you know, it is. I. So those are my thoughts. I've been rambling a little bit in this video. But thanks for, for checking out if you made it this far, if you made it to the end. And I hope you'll come back again um, if you want, if you benefit from this. If you enjoyed it, like, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section. And I'd love to see you again. So you're welcome to subscribe. Until next time.